that next Sunday. But today, we're going to continue on last Sunday's uh, lesson that I was uh, spoke online. Where I began talking about the eight characteristics, strong, that's it. That spirit has got a lot of characteristics, but there are specific ones that are outstanding. They are potent. And they uh, are powerful. And we talked about uh, those last week, which have to do with deception, manipulation, strength in leadership, insubordination, feigned or false repentance, sexual immorality, pride, and threats. And that spirit uses all of those strengths to intimidate you. And mostly and more over. demon uses to manipulate we got talking about some of those which were threats and money oh boy I've been I've been threatened many times with money not threatened but manipulate or tried to be manipulated I remember once tell you a little bit of story about me I remember once I was working somewhere and I received every year, the end of every year, a $10,000 bonus. That's a lot of money. $10,000. Every December, I received $10,000. Everybody, many people in the organization had received pay increases over the years. I received none. And the reason I was told I received none was because of jealousy. And we don't want to increase your wages above others because of jealousy. And I said, that's fine. I mean, God takes care of me. I'm a, but we're going to give you a $10,000 bonus under the table, and nobody is to know about it. I said, that's fine. Hey, I'm happy. Helps me pay for all the Christmas presents for all the grandchildren, which are increasing. So every year, for a number of years, I received $10,000 check came to me at, in the beginning of December. One day, something happened. And it had to do with another minister, in another country. And I made it known what was going on. I confronted the issue. And it was very potent. It was destructive, destructive towards us, towards my wife and myself. And so I made it known and uh, wanted to get this cleared up. This is how I was met with my complaint. Don't you receive $10,000 a year? And I said, yes, I do. Then shut your mouth. Right? Bribing me. Bribing me to be silent about a corruption and a wickedness that was going on. This is the spirit of Jezebel. This is how Jerobel, Jezebel moves. Money has to do with, you know, being uh, rewarded for something. Money is not just, you know, money. Money can be anything that is a reward to you. And the same thing as is a uh, reward given to manipulate you, they also, this Jezebel spirit withholds reward, withholds money. Let's see how you do without my support. Let's see how you do without my money. And this is one of the things that people have attempted around the world and back again to, to uh, quelch and squash the work and the growth of Seven Pillars Church 
It's got to do with money. Don't give them money. Because if you give them money, they're going to work. If you stop giving them money, the work will stop. Wrong. Hallelujah. How much money did Jesus need to fulfill his Father's will? Praise the Lord. So that's one of the things that uh, are used. Flattery. We talked about flattery, threats, money, and mood. All these things. That's all in last week's lesson. Today, I'm going to talk about the last two things on this list of tools that the Jesuit... Were you going to use those lights or not? Yeah, let's, let's give it as much light on the case as possible. If it makes the video better, there you go. For those who are watching, thank you, Lord, or will be watching. Thank you. The last two uh, things on my list, these are things that, you know, have been thrown at me down through the years. And they are, number one, seduction, and number two, sensuality. <laughs> Heavy, right? Seduction and sensuality. Two things that the church in general is full of. Seduction and sensuality. I wonder how many of God's people, I'm not talking about just this church, I'm talking about in general. I wonder how many, when they are preparing themselves to go to the house of God on Sunday morning, I wonder how many of them look in the mirror and say, am I pleasing God with how I appear? As opposed to how many will look in the mirror and not think sensuality, not think I want to be sensual, and yet dress themselves, behave themselves, even look at themselves in a sensual way, propagating something, putting something out there, a feeling, a vibe, which is actually called a spirit. The church is full of this type of nonsense. And, and we may be in wintertime now here in South Africa and we all get bundled up and dressed, but man comes springtime. Everybody starts to take it all off, and all of a sudden, you know, sensuality starts to flow. And, and it's like, you know, oh, I just want to look cute. I want to look nice. And, and yes, and sometimes people even think, I want to attract somebody. Sensuality. But it's not only that. I'll talk about it. First, let's talk about seduction. Go to 2 Timothy <clears throat> chapter 3. You're going to be shocked at what the word seduction means in the Word of God. Woo! I'm going to read for you in verse 13 and 14. I'm in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 13 and 14. I'm sorry, what did I say? Peter, where did Peter come from? I know Peter's knocking on my door, so go home. It's Timothy. We're visiting Timothy right now. So 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 13 and 14. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse deceiving and being deceived. It's talking about the end times. I'm going to read it again. But evil men, <coughs> excuse me, and seducers shall wax worse and worse, 
deceiving and being deceived. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of or things that you have been convicted of. Continue, stay, abide, remain, dwell in, stand in, endure in. Bless the Lord. Praise God. It means to stay, this word continue, in a given place, state, relation, or expectancy. Remain in your God-given place. Stay where God has positioned you. Continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured. Things that you have been convicted and convinced about. I wish somebody would bless God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. How many convictions, how many persuasions, how many things have we been convinced about down through the years of our walk with God that today are under lock and seal in a box somewhere under the bed? Get rid of it for a little bit. It's a burden. It's too heavy. I don't want to do that. But yet it was a conviction. It was something God put his finger on. It's something that you knew to be true. He said, continue in those things that you have been convicted of. And knowing of whom thou hast learned them. In other words, listen to me. In this age of information... Where, there, where information about anything is at your fingertips. All you got to do is go to Mr. Google and type in a word that you want to know about, a theme, a whatever it may be, and phew, up it comes. And what I've noticed, the trend that I've noticed in the church and, and among, I don't care about all the other churches. I care, but they're not my responsibility. My responsibility is my family. And what I've noticed in my own family is people roaming around on the web, listening to voices they do not know. Know those who you learn from. Know who they are. Know the fruit of their life. Know what they stand for. Know who they stand for. Glory be to God. But you get all these frivolous people, weak, weak, just weaklings, tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine that comes on the internet. Oh, I learned, I heard, oh, that was so powerful. Oh, that really ministered to me. Where'd you learn that? Who did you learn that from? Well, I don't know, some prophet out there? Uh Uh-huh, yeah. Before you call anybody a prophet, make sure you know the fruit on their tree. Before you listen to that voice, And take that voice as a guiding light in your life. Know that person. Know that voice. And this is what Paul is admonishing. I mean, Paul. Timothy is is admonishing Timothy. Hallelujah. Continue in the things you're convinced of. And know those from who you have learned them. Hallelujah. Why? Go back to verse 13. Because there are evil men. Because there are evil men who are seducers. 
They have a Jezebel spirit of seduction on them. A seduction is a power to allure. It is a power to remove you out of the way. It is a power to take your vision and focus and put it in a different direction. It is a power to persuade your feet to walk where you have not chosen to walk. It is a power to cause you to believe something that is not true or is part truth and part error. This is the day we're in. This is the generation. This is the time when we, meet, we need to be delivered and set free from that spirit of... Ah, that spirit of Jezebel that is seducing, like Jesus said to the Thyatira church, she seduces my servants. She's not trying to seduce the little one out there who's already got one foot in the world and one foot in the kingdom of God. She's not concerned about them. She's already got them. Her power of seduction targets the servants. Are you a servant of God? If you are, you've got a bullseye on your chest. You are a target of that spirit. I'm not trying to uh, uh, put fear on you. I'm trying to awaken you that you will become heightened in your awareness, in your consciousness, when that spirit comes with its seducing power to lead you astray. I dare say that for many of us, it happens a hundred times a day. Hundred percent. Sly, seductive, serpentine. Okay, so let's talk about this word, seduce. <clears throat> it means, are you ready for this? Or do you want to go home? <laughs> are we done yet? <laughs> Like you all say here in South Africa, shame. <laughs> I just love that. Like when I first came and started here, people were saying, oh, sh ach, ach, shame. Ach, shame. I'm like, wasn't quite sure about that. But so I'm going to say it to you all, ach, shame. <laughs> but evil men and seducers. Okay. This word, seducers, means to be a wizard. To be a wizard. What is a wizard? A wizard is one who has certain magical, mysterious, or supernatural power. Magical, mysterious, and supernatural power. Power. Oh, the times I've had Jezebels in my churches who had the gifts of the Spirit growing out of their ears, it seemed. They had a power, an uncanny power to look into people's lives and read them and know what they were going through. Not because they had a word of knowledge from God, but they had a spirit of divination, a divining spirit to be able to read into a person's circumstance. Jezebels in a church have got eyes like this. 
They're everywhere. And they will read how you walk in. They will read how you sit. They will read how you worship. They're like, hmm, there's a problem there. So then they take their little twisted gift and their little mysterious power and they go to this person and say, the Lord told me that you are going through a tremendous suffering. <gasps> really? Oh, you must be a true servant of God because I am. I know, honey, I know. Seduction. And their work and ministry is never to lead you under the authority of God. If it were, then they would bring you to the pastor. And they would say, Pastor, I have a word to them from the Lord. May I give it in your presence. So that the spirit can be tested. I've always said, I've said for years now, if somebody comes to you, if it's in a service, in the parking lot, in the bathroom, or in the mall, wherever it may be, and start to whisper in your ear a word from God, I got one word, run! Run! Because there's no way that spirit can be tested. Hallelujah. It has happened in my life over and over and over again. It is the most foul, insubordinate spirit to try and allure people not to God, not under the authority of God, but to themselves to my mental, my ministry, my greatness, my calling. This is what the word wizard means. But that's not all. It means to mutter. <laughs> seducer. This word seducers means to mutter a spell. To mutter, listen to this. Ooh. I just love sucking Jesse in the teeth. I'll pay for it tomorrow, but I'm. St you all pray for us. You get behind me now. Mutter. It means to speak. Almost an audible voice. Whisper. That means to go private. To go in secret. It means to talk unofficially about someone or something in secret. This is what seduction will do. It will always go behind the back. It will never be to the face. It will never speak in truth. It will never speak in the light. It will always be somewhere from behind. This is what the word mutter means. To speak in this low, almost inaudible tone. Secretive, quiet. So that if that thing is ever confronted, uh, I, didn't, I didn't say that. I, I, I didn't do that. I wasn't a part of that. Who heard that? Did anybody hear that? It's not possible. Nobody heard that. Oh, glory to God. Hallelujah. <clears throat> now, you all know, maybe you don't, but if you've heard what I've said about this in times past, I don't agree 
neither do I endorse or stand for chanting. And there's a reason I don't. To mutter also means to wail and to repeat over and over again. Monks in Eastern religions mutter. <laughs> For hours. That's a mutter. Repetitious tones and repetitious sounds create a portal for demons. It is almost like taking a chisel and a hammer and chiseling your way through a rock and making an opening for something to enter. Until the doors open. It is the invoking of spirits. You say, well, can't we chant, you know, Jehovah and yud heh vah and all that? No, you cannot. Because in this, trust me, I'm not teaching on this right now, just trust me in the moment. I've been in places where I've seen people chanting, muttering the name of the Lord. And they go into a frenzy. Their eyes change. They become glassed over. Some people leave and they don't even know who they are. Oh, they're so drunk in the spirit. Yeah, in a demonic spirit. A portal was open. Muttering attracts demons. Muttering invokes evil spirits. And this is why Eastern religions use muttering. This is what seduction means. Now, how does that relate to us? Since we don't sit here in this church and go, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, do we? If you do, I slap you. No, we don't. So how does that spirit that seducing spirit of Jezebel affect you. The power and the validation of her seducing words comes through repetition. So let's say, for example, somebody has said something about you. Let's say, Sister Lorraine, that somebody... Sister Pedro said something evil about you. I know she would never do that. But let's say she did. But not to your face. She said it to somebody else. She said it to Sister Letitia. And it came to your ears. Now you may hear it once from her, but you begin repeating it. And through repetition, it's validated. I saw it. I wish somebody would shout to the Lord. Hey, she come on, Rabba Sata Rabba Haya. Hey, Shahai. E Shaka Rabba Sonia Rahaya. Bless the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Is given to those words through repetition. Just like the mutterers, 
mutter over and over and over and over again, validating their presence in the presence of power. And the more they do, the more the power comes. The more they go into a, a state, a consciousness beyond themselves. And this is what happens to us. That spirit of Jezebel trying to seduce you like a wizard with mysterious power and muttering words, curses about what you can and cannot do, who you think you are and who you are not. And we, being the stupid ones that we are, we established that in the beginning, didn't we? <laughs> Hallelujah. It may be said once to us, but we validate Jezebel's seduction and we repeat. And we mutter over and over and over again. Oh, they hate me. 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 I did that pretty good for a 62 year old. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yes. How many of us have been seduced and pulled aside because we listened to a voice, somebody's voice. At this present moment, there are voices out there. Jezebel voices saying, oh, the Hansons made a mistake moving to South Africa. This church, Seven Pillars, is not going anywhere now because they have left the United States. They've lost their impact, lost their inroad, lost financial support, and now it's going to die. Yes, I've heard these words. They're hard words to hear. And I've had to cut them off because it's seduction. Now, I, I can see that a higher. I could. Thank you, Jesus. There have been mornings since we came back from the United States. I'm an early bird. I like to get up early, long before daylight, and go and be with Jesus. That's my normal routine. Not every day. Sometimes I sleep in a little later. But most mornings I do. And there have been some mornings when I have awakened and these voices are in my ear and I feel the oppression to the point where it's almost like a depression. Like what, what am I doing here? Why? did we do this? Why did we leave everything? Why did we sell our home? Why did we leave our church? Why did we... And there goes the voices, repetitious. And if I'm not careful, I validate those voices. I give power to the voice. I know what the will of God is. I know what he spoke to us, both separately and through many others. Yes. I know how he's opened doors. We got the three-year visa. 
which was nothing short of a miracle. We walked into that South African embassy in Washington and we just looked at each other like, this is in God's hands. We were warned the day before we left South Africa from the immigration lawyer who had helped us formulate all the papers we needed. He wrote to me and he said, well, I just want to let you know that the embassy that you're going to in Washington doesn't take kindly to this type of visa. And I don't know anyone who's asked for it who's actually gotten it. That's what he said. I'm like, now you tell me? After all this? We already bought a house, but you talk about faith. We already, you know, we got ourselves settled. And so we walked into that embassy, and I know you were all praying, and they were praying in the States, and we were praying, and, you know, we joined hands before we went in, and God, this is in, this is in, in your care. We are yours. We belong to no man. Have your way. We go in there, and the receptionist was not there. Nobody was there. But all of a sudden, a door at the back opened. Who comes walking out but the visa interv interview guy? The interviewer, he's got a name, but I don't remember what they call him. He comes out. And immediately, I'd already studied up on this guy. I'd been on his Facebook. and <laughs> I, I want to know his strengths and his weaknesses before I met him. And I've, I discovered that he was a seven-day Adventist. So at least he had some kind of, we had some kind of comradery as far as, you know, God. But he is reported to be a mean man. Everybody, their views are not good. This guy is rude. He's mean. Yeah, yeah. He comes out with this big smile. Hello, are you the Hansons? Yes, I'll be with you in a minute. We were 45 minutes early, 30 minutes early. He called us back there, and we gave him this stack of documents. Man, it took us forever to get those documents. Fingerprints, photographs, FBI reports, medical reports, chest x-rays, blood work. I mean, it cost us thousands of dollars. He handed that paper in, those papers in, and he said, He went like that. He looked at me. You are asking for three years? And I said, yes. He went. <laughs> I thought, oh, boy. <laughs> God's got to be in this. A few weeks later, we had our visas. A miracle. It's a miracle. So I say all that to say we know what God has spoken. Yes. We know what he has said. But wouldn't that demon just love to seduce you out of your course? Take you away from the course that God has set you on to fulfill his will and his purpose. And how does that happen? Not by just you hearing what somebody said, but by you repeating it. You validate it. You give the words power. Hallelujah. Am I making any sense today? This is how Jezebel's seduction works. It is wizardly. It is mysterious. It is powerful. It will look like the power of God. It will look like the gifts of the Spirit. It will look like true inspiration. After all, she called herself a prophetess. She called herself an inspired one. That Spirit will always come like tremendous inspiration. Hallelujah. Okay, moving on. I'm not getting very far. But that's okay. We'll get as far as we can get. And then, how long have I been preaching? <laughs> he says 45 minutes. I got a whole hour ahead of me yet. No, I'm just kidding.
Hallelujah. Sensual. Let's move on to that. Sensuality. Let's go to Jude. Jude lives right next door to Revelation. <clears throat> Jude chapter 1, because there's only one chapter. The word sensual means the, grat the gratification, listen, the gratification of the natural, physical senses. You've got five senses. You've got sight, taste, smell, hearing, and touch. Sensuality is the gratification of those senses. It's not always got to do with sex. Sensuality is simply gratifying touching somebody, smelling somebody, seeing somebody. <laughs> oh, there's a lot of things I'd like to say, but I'm trying to be a good boy. But especially that which involves sexual pleasure. Let me read that again. Sensual, sensuality means the gratification of the natural physical senses, especially that which involves sexual pleasures. Now, I'm reading here in Jude. I'm in um, verse 18. Is everybody with me? Yes. How that they told you there should be mockers in the last time. Here we're talking about the end again. All these places I'm going, we're talking about the end times. And this is where we are in time. There should be mockers in the last time or in the last days who should walk after their own ungodly lusts. Listen here. These be they who separate themselves. Now that's not talking about separation. Holy separation. This word separate themselves means actually they cause division. These be they who separate themselves. They are sensual having not the Spirit. I'm going to read it to you from the Amplified Version of the Bible. These are the ones who are agitators. I love it. They are agitators. Oh, there is nothing worse being a pastor than having agitators. They just, they're aggravating. <laughs> These are the ones who are agitators, causing divisions. They are worldly minded, secular, unspiritual, carnal, merely sensual, devoid of the spirit, the breath, the inspiration of God. That's how it reads. In the last times, there's going to be such mockers. They are full of their own lust. They are agitators. They are aggravators. They are dividers. They divide the unity among the people with their sensuality, which is not just about sex. I already told you that. It's got to do with attracting the senses. Causing the senses to see, smell, taste, hear, and touch anything but godliness. This is sensuality. <clears throat> I want to show you an example of Jezebel's manipulation. Go to 1 Kings. 
chapter 18. Saints of God, if you are half sincere before the Lord, surely we should in these last times become conscious and aware of that spirit that would set on you, rest on you, and cause you, cause you to be a channel through which the spirit of Jezebel stirs the senses of another, causing division within the church. You're an agitator when you do that, devoid of the inspired breath of God. I've had them in every single one of the churches that I've ever pastored. There's always there. There's always one or two. I'm not saying, I don't know you all that well, but I can't pick out one here. At least not yet. <laughs> you have to talk to your pastors when they get home. <laughs> Hallelujah. But this, it, the, the spirit, seduction and sensuality, I, I left them to the last here. They're last, but they're not least. They are two of the most potent tools used by the spirit of Jezebel in your life, in my life, in the church, in your home, in your family, in your marriages, on your jobs, wherever you may be. Seduction and sensuality, grabbing your senses and seducing you away from the truth. Wake up, people. Why do you feel the way you feel when you are in the floor? Why? You've got to ask yourself that question. Why do I wake up Monday morning and go, <laughs> I don't want to live. I would rather die than to get up and face the day. Is that godly? Something's wrong. Something is seducing you. Something is pulling away at your senses. Something has awakened you to something that is outside the sphere of the Spirit of God. And we must wake up and rise up against that spirit. Oh, come on, sita hare basata. Read mandala la masukari ala la masai. Glory to God, hallelujah. Hallelujah. It is the time, it's the day, it's the season to say, you know what? It's enough already. This is what your pastor was telling me the other day. We were talking about this. He said, it's enough already. I said, you got that right. It is enough already. But you see, we validate these things with our own words, our own input, our, our own thoughts, our own muttering. Yes? Yeah. Echtor. <laughs> How do you say it? Uh, ik moet Afrikaans leren. Is that, is that good Afrikaans? <laughs> it's my Dutch, so you know. Speak Dutch, put a little bit of a twist to it, and then you've got Afrikaans. <laughs> now, I'll end with this. We're looking here in this chapter at a guy called Obadiah, not the prophet Obadiah. Obadiah was the chief of staff in Ahab's palace. <laughs> in his government, Obadiah 
was the chief of staff. The name Obadiah means the servant of Yahweh. He was a servant of God. He feared God. He loved the Lord his God. He stood for the Lord his God. Oh, how we need Obadiahs today. But this was in the day of Jezebel wreaking havoc in Jezreel. She had been married into the nation of Israel. She married the king of Israel, the wicked cuss Ahab. And she seduced with her mysterious powers a whole nation away from the things of God. A total turnaround to worship the East, to worship Baal. It's amazing how many churches, I don't know about here in South Africa, but in the United States who have turned to the East, Eastern religions, yoga, Eastern meditations, mantras, and all that stuff. In their churches, they've turned their back on the temple and they're facing the sun. Baal. Jezebel did that. The spirit of seduction using her sensuality and her mysterious powers to allure the people of God away from God. Jezebel managed, listen, she managed to turn the king, the priests, and the prophets, not all of them, but many of them. The priesthood that served in the temple, they turned after Jezebel, and they served Baal. <laughs> she had 450 prophets. Where did she get them from? They were the prophets of God that she converted with her seduction, her flattery, her money, her mood, her threats. Oh, I don't use the word hate very often, but I hate that spirit. I hate it with an absolute passion. As much as I love God, that's how much I hate that spirit. I've seen what it's done to multitudes, including me, over the years. So here we are. In this time, Jezebel had killed prophets of the Lord. She had turned a nation against God. So here's Obadiah, the servant of Yahweh. He goes and he takes a hundred prophets that have not yet been slaughtered. And he hides them in a cave. Now for many years, I looked at that story and I'm like, good old Obadiah. He protected the prophets of God. Recently, the, the Lord turned the bowl around for me. And I saw that story in a totally different light. What really happened? Let me show you. You all interested? Yeah. I know you are. You're a nosy bunch of people. You've, have, you've had good shepherds that have made you nosy. I'm in uh, 1 Kings 18, 13. Was it not told my Lord? This is Obadiah speaking to Elijah. Was it not told my Lord what I did when Jezebel slew the prophets of the Lord, how I hid a hundred men of the Lord's prophets by 50 in a cave and fed them with bread and water? Do you read anywhere where Jezebel pursued them? She didn't pursue them. Do you even read anywhere where, when Elijah ran from Jez, Jezreel because of Jezebel's threats to touch his life? She said, I am going to touch your life. 
and he ran for his life. Read it. These are the exact words your Bible says. He ran for his life. He had just sl slain 450 prophets of Baal. He was zealous for God. He was up on Mount Carmel. He called down the fire of God upon the altar. Talk about a mighty man of God. But one seductive voice rose up and said, I'm going to kill you. I'm going to touch your life. You're going to wish you had never done what you did. And Elijah goes, ah. <sighs> stage left, off he goes, takes off. Did Jezebel pursue him? Nope, no. She didn't care how she got rid of the prophets, whether it was through killing them or through them fleeing or by them hiding in a cave. It is so powerful. Look, I'm about to tell you something. Go back up to verse 4. For it was so when Jezebel, this virgin, ha, cut off the prophets of the Lord, that Obadiah took a hundred prophets and hid them by fifty in a cave and fed them with bread and water. And I always looked at that like, wow, the courage of that man to go search out a cave and take the prophets of the Lord and put them in there. And No, I have changed my opinion of his actions. He was threatened by Jezebel. And he took God's inspiration, the voices of inspiration, and put them in hiding. The word cave has nothing, no positive meaning at all. It means a dark cavern. Oh, have you been to that dark place where your inspiration is snuffed out, chopped off? Oh, you're still alive. You're still alive. But you're in hiding. You're not fulfilling your purpose. They were taken away from their purpose, which was to speak the divine inspired word over Israel. They could not do that in a dark cave. Jezebel was like, oh, leave them alone. I don't care. As long as they're in there with their mouth shut, I don't care. This word cave, it means a hole. <laughs> you ever feel like you're in a hole? A den. It, listen now. It means to be bare and stripped naked. Stripped naked of your mantle. Stripped naked of your calling. Stripped naked of your joy. Stripped naked of your victory. Stripped naked of your purpose. Stripped naked of your vision. Stripped naked of your destiny. And this is where some of you are seated here today. You're alive, but you're not fulfilling your purpose. You're hiding in your cave. You're hiding in your dark hole, and you know that darkness. You feel it in your daily life. You feel it in your home. You feel it in your job. You feel it driving down the road. You feel it walking into church. You feel it in your relationships. You feel it in your marriage. You feel it in your counsel session. There's a darkness that you have been led into by seduction. Ah. Shahabasata. 
I thank God that today I'm not speaking by theory. I have been in that cave. I know that cave. I know that darkness. I know that hole. I know when the inspired voice is shut up and when I've been seduced away from speaking the truth and being bold to stand in Israel and be a troublemaker in Israel. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I saw I've been there. Ask my wife. She can tell you. I've been in that cave. Like, well, at least I'm alive. And they're in there like, well, at least we're alive. But not fulfilling their purpose. What's the purpose of being in there alive when you're stripped naked of your calling? Why even be alive? You're fulfilling nothing. Those are the horse's hoofs. Have I made sense today at all? This is where we are. This is what we are facing. This is what you have been facing. This is what people that are walking with me have been facing, are facing all around the world. Can we not just tone it down a little bit and go in the hole? Because I mean, they're talking about us. And I, I had some very threatening things sent to me last week it didn't look like a threat did it babe it looked like an open invitation to something grand and powerful first when I received this I was like what this is incredible look what God is doing God's opening these doors and I was about to respond, and the Spirit of the Lord stopped me. He said, don't respond, investigate. So I investigated, only to find out that it was a hoax to try to entrap me into a trap where they could have done me harm. Right? Right? That put a little bit of a jolt in me. I'm like, man, maybe we just need to back off a little bit because we're upsetting some people. The word is upsetting some people. What we're doing is upsetting some people. But you see, that's seduction. That's the servant of Yahweh trying to do a good thing, leading me into a cave. Be quiet. Hush for a moment. Guess what? Amen. I ain't hushing. Jesus. This is, you know, if you just stop and think about it, I hope you go back over this lesson. This is a milestone for many of you. And it can be a changing point in your, in your walk with God if you let it, if you choose it, and if you start to practice differently Instead of using your time and energy to mutter, <laughs> to repeat, and more and 
more demons are attracted to that. And you just go down into despair, shame, guilt, fear, anxiety, depression, and none of it's godly. This is not the fruit of God. This is not the fruit of his spirit. It is a seducing, sensual demon that is called to entrap you like a spider's web and bring you into a hole of darkness. See, you're alive, you're safe. Just stay there. Just stay there. You'll be okay. Just stay there. Everything will be fine. And there you rot. Not fulfilling who God has purposed you to be. So, next week, don't come next week. I'm encouraging you not to come. Unless you want to be set free. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Hey, she cut up for ya. Bless the Lord. Praise God. If you want to be set free, then you come next week. I don't know how we're going to do what. I don't know what, how. Prayer, word, word, prayer, worship, no worship. Prayer, prayer, I don't know. It doesn't matter. Church is not about a form. It's about God having his way. And, and uh, Pastor Rowan and I have talked about this with, with Sister Hanson and Sister uh, Pastor Valerie. We've talked about it many, many times. How, how tired we are of church. All I want is God. Forget church. I just want God. So I don't, I don't know how it's going to look. I have no clue. I just know that if you come expectant, prayed up, fasted up, maybe take a few days, a day here, whatever, fast from something during the week, and we are going to believe God for a, an outpouring of his deliverance. Get us free from the things that have held us in the cave that you thought was your safety. And it's not. It's your demise. Praise God. Let's bow our heads. Blessed be the name of Jesus. Lamb of God, I'm so thankful for this church, for these people, for their pastors, for the sincere ones that stand before your presence today. You see our hearts. You see our need. You see our bondages. You see the caves that we're in. Oh God, in Jesus' name, convict our hearts. Bring us up. Lead us forth. Bring deliverance upon your people. My God, Jesus, hallelujah. 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 Guide your people. Lead us forth. Go ahead and spend some time in prayer before the Lord.